another week has just gone by and here we are again on Culture Mosaic, a weekly journal on culture scene here in Vietnam. And the highlight of this episode is going to be our reporter's visit to a faraway land, Indonesia. Here we'll discover the country's nature, historical heritage and cultural diversity. But before we get to that, let's check out what we have for you in the next 30 minutes of our show today. First, we'll off to the Mekong Tata region for a visit to a village that makes us fishing boats. Later, we'll talk to a special contemporary ballet dance troupe and their mission of connecting people. And our reporter Huang Hang will bring you up close to all the splendors of Indonesia, the land of wonders. Join us for some cultural updates and more. We now begin with some culture stories in our cultural and lifestyle segments. In the past, bread mat was among the must-have item in all families in Vietnam. For bedding, family meal, and leisure activities, it was hardly seen no presence of a mat. With its multi-purpose use, mat making and trading was very thriving then, and nowadays it is still a popular item in rural area of the country. We follow Thomas Banner, an English host, to journey to the Kimson district in the northern province of Ningbing to learn more about the craft of mat weaving. Kimson is one among six districts of Ningbing province. The community's best-known landmark is the Fat Diem Cathedral. It is famous for the beautiful architecture which fuses Oriental and Western styles. People in Kimson mainly live off agriculture, while various small communities ply their trade at weaving, each boasting signature styles. I am going to the scenic village named Kim Ching, where reed mat weaving has brought wealth and a sense of identity to the villagers. The workshop that I'm going to visit is among the best in the community. Em chào anh. À, chào chú. Thomas đã gặp uh, một bạn khác gần đây. Bạn ấy nói um, ở đây là siêu bạn nhất ở Kim Trình. Nói chung là, là toàn bộ cả nàng luôn. Là làm cái nghề chiếu cói này. Have you noticed this special spike? Tan tells me that he invented it so as to pull out the cover of the grass roots. The reeds are dried, but before the weaving process begins, they are soaked in water to provide the material with moisture. The reeds then have a soft yet durable texture suitable for mat making. Another key material is jute cord. Jute cords are used as vertical yarns while the reeds are fashioned into horizontal threads. Two people are required in the weaving process. I'm surprised that it's not something that a machine does. They do it with their hands. So it's just kind of um, impressive the resolve that the um, artisans have to sit down for hours on end, hours at a time, and they can be there all day. Và một tay này cầm cõi Chứ không biết thì khoảng quấn ra một phát vậy Đấy, được rồi Quang quả Đấy This is, this is just so difficult uh, Mummy, I want to go home This is too difficult Nói thế chứ nhưng mà cứ học là được à Ngày xưa anh chị làm ở đây là nhanh lắm Cứ bố mẹ giật là con vang là Cứ học hỏi nhau làm từ truyền thống của cha ông để lại ở đây Mà bây giờ tất cả cả nàng làm như thế Anh ơi, tại sao ở thành phố rất nhiều người muốn ngư trên đẹp Nhưng mà anh vẫn làm chiếu Thành phố có điều hòa thì là còn nằm đệm được Nhưng mà ở thôn quê tôi không nắp điều hòa vì là tiết kiệm điện rồi này nọ nắm thứ tiền lắm ừ, cho nên rằng là ở chúng tôi là giữ cái ngày truyền thống này là như thế ừ. 
In Vietnamese, they call the play mat chiu đậu. It can be dried for longer to protract its life. If a customer places an order, Mr. Tan will bring his mats to another workshop, where the mats are embellished and made more colorful. It seems that in the summertime, he has to work around the clock. The printing workshop is more fun, at least for me. Firstly, people don't have to squat down while doing their job. Secondly, they work with the aid of templates, reducing the risk of error. Seems like a good time to try it out. Thomas, thấy chiếu Việt Nam có đẹp không? Rất đẹp, rất đẹp. Đẹp à? As you can see, these two ladies are working on the painting. The idea is that these mats are going to be sold to newly married couples to celebrate their great occasion as a gift. So there's a mat over there which says "Chúc mừng hạnh phúc," which means we wish you we wish you happiness. To enhance the color of the mats, they are steamed. Chiều bao lâu ở đây? Tầm một tiếng, sáu mươi phút. Okay, okay, about about one hour in here. So then the mats are taken out and the paint has been transformed into really bright, really vivid colour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay, so this one's a finished product. Here's the finished article. This is what they look like once they're done. The paint is dried and everything's perfect, ready for sale. Vietnam's Mekong Delta is a vast region where the Mekong River meets the sea. It is thanks to this network that locals can travel everywhere on boats. They can pass cities, towns and villages and even enter Cambodia without getting on the mainland. That is also why boats are considered an indispensable part of the colorful life in the Mekong Delta. Are you curious how each boat is made? Right now we'll take you to a village that specializes in making boat. I'm floating on the Mekong River, which is stretched across the southwest region of Vietnam. Now back in the city, we tend to get around by motorbike or perhaps car. But out here, the most popular means of transportation is boat. I'm joining Tho, a resident of okay. Tae Tuong Hamlet okay. in Chiang Mai okay. district, to purchase wood to build a boat. Ta is an experienced boat builder in the area, having done this job for nearly 40 years. Sal timber is light and resists water well, so the locals use only this type of wood to build boats. Ba khúc là mình cưa da dán là mình đóng khoảng là 4 chiếc xuồng tới 5 chiếc xuồng. And so we are taking them towards the workshop now where we're going to construct the boat so I'm pretty excited to see what kind of uh, amazing structure becomes of these basic rudimentary big logs here. Lying peacefully in Ziang Island, an area of land in the middle of the Tien River, Te Tuang Hamlet has been known for the craft of boat building since the first people settled here. The hamlet is the main supplier of boats to fishermen across the Mekong Delta. It 
It's amazing we were able to get these super thin and flexible planks of wood from the sow trees that we chopped down in the garden. Well, it's eight o'clock in the evening now, so come with me and I'll show you the progress that Ang Tur and I made on the boat we were constructing earlier. Here's one that he made earlier, and um, he's working on the final stages of it. In a life surrounded by rivers and canals, the people of the Mekong Delta always come up with new ideas. Besides building boats for regular travel purposes, they also create specialized vessels for farming, catching, and transporting fish. Arriving in Tingbien district, I meet Hai, someone who has years of experience converting normal boats into fishing boats. That's exactly what he'll do today. He will show me how to transform a simple wooden vessel into a fearsome trawler. So as Chu Hai has just explained to me, um, the reason why we are cutting these smaller pieces of bamboo is kind of, in a way, to use them as bars um, that are going to go um, alongside the, the hole that's been notched out, um, like a little fish prison. So the fish cannot swim away through the hole through which the water will seep in. So we're going to keep them locked in. <laughs> and now we're going to put them inside um, Chu Hai's invention, which is to have this compartment containing water, which keeps the fish alive. And so he can sell live fish at the market and in so doing, increase their market value. You're watching another edition of Culture Mosaic coming to you from the capital city of Hanoi. Each week, the show highlights images and stories reflecting the rich diversity of the country's people and customs. Culture Mosaic also offers an insight into everyday life here in Vietnam, and it also aims to keep you up to date to culture news in the fast-growing country. So stay tuned for more cultural stories. Dancing is an art and it can be a communication form that helps connect people together, especially those of different backgrounds and disadvantaged groups. This is exactly the mission of a special contemporary ballet dance troupe. Our VTV reporter Ziu Ang got a chance to catch up with this American dancing group in the On The My Corner this week. It can be really joyous or really emotional. This is a clip of the Battery Dance Company, a world-renowned contemporary dance troupe from New York City, USA. It was founded in 1976 and has dedicated nearly 40 years to the pursuit of artistic excellence and making the arts available to everyone. 
The company was founded by Jonathan Hollander, an outstanding choreographer of his generation, and five other talented and passionate dancers. In 1995, the company visited Vietnam for the first time in Ho Chi Minh City. Ten years later, they returned for two performances in Hanoi, along with the Dance to Connect initiative for youth in Hanoi and Hue City. So in our On the Mic segment this week, we are glad to talk to Mr. Jonathan Hollander, the president and the artistic director of the Battery Dance Company. Thank you so much for being here for our interview. So how do you feel about Vietnam? Well, we feel entirely comfortable in Vietnam. We feel that the, uh, we have been welcomed so warmly by the people here. And I think there's a lot of curiosity about a dance company from New York. So we're gaining from being sort of different and unusual. Um, and there's a lot of talent here. The young people are ready to experiment which is great because they haven't had a lot of modern and contemporary dance here. Um, and yet we found that they're very willing and, and very uh, ready to jump into our program. During your trip to Vietnam this time, you also visited Hue. So tell me a little bit about your experience there. Well, Hue is, is a remarkable place. Being in the, the Citadel and performing in the Royal Theater was an experience that we will never forget. It's an ornate, beautiful space. And the whole atmosphere inside the Citadel is something that you just feel like you're walking into history. Now, last time was a fabulous experience, so we've been thrilled with the opportunity to come back. And we feel so privileged and honored to, to be here again. This time around in Vietnam, besides two performances at the Hanoi Opera House and the Vietnam Dance College, the Battery Dance Company also held workshops under their Dance to Connect program. Dance to Connect is a company's initiative to connect cultures and engage young people in dance. This program has been implemented in 30 countries and territories throughout the world since 2006 and through many instructional means, even Skype. This is the first time such a workshop has been organized in Vietnam, which will run from October 11 to the 21st in Hanoi and Hue. Developing this, this, this project that we have, the language is a very hard thing. You know, like, I don't know any I'm Vietnamese, so all I know how to do is dance. And this is how I connect with my students. It means that we are connecting um, through dance. So we're getting to know each other by dancing together. And we're creating trust and um, new ideas. We're creating choreography together through dancing. The dancers of Battery Dance Company will share their techniques through practical training in the form of workshops with students. During these courses, students can learn the basics of contemporary dance, ballet and hip-hop, as well as how to evoke creativity and explore their own body language. Mình thấy lớp học này nó rất là thú vị và bổ ích ạ. Hầu hết những cái người học viên mới đến đây à, chưa ai quen nhau cả mà chỉ còn sau một buổi thôi là tất cả mọi người đã kiểu rất là thân nhau. Battery Dance Company's history of outreach to diverse international audiences has earned it the reputation of being the leader in cultural diplomacy. Breaking down barriers between people, the organization aims to make dance accessible to everyone. That you, when you see that what you're doing is working and it's helping, and in the case of Battery Dance, for instance, it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. Many children who benefit from it. When we leave, something is left behind that they've learned and they continue with, and we hope they pass it on. So we're, we're very encouraged that uh, what we're doing ignites a spark in all of these young people. Could you please elaborate uh, more on the Dance to Connect initiative? And why did you choose to conduct uh, the initiative here in Vietnam? Well, the Dancing to Connect program is Battery Dance Company's signature arts education initiative. And it grew out of many, many years of working with high school students in New York City public schools. Our teaching artists, who are choreographers and dancers themselves, do not 
demonstrate movement. They elicit movement from the participants themselves so that at the end of the 20 hours, the participants can go on a stage and can perform works that are their own. They can say, how do you like my piece? It belongs to them, it doesn't belong to us. And so it's a gift back and forth. And many of them had not ever had dance before. And that's part of the feature of Dancing to Connect that makes it different, is that we work with people whether or not they've had prior dance training. I know that your Dance to Connect initiative aims at disadvantage people, so why is that? I think as dancers and as people, as citizens of the world, we want to be able to make an impact where it's most needed. So we're very excited when we have the opportunity to reach people who wouldn't ordinarily have this uh, experience. Here in Vietnam, we d I don't know the socioeconomic background of the people we're working with, but the fact is that the opportunity we're giving them is not something that they would normally have. It's a question of what do we have that we can give? You know, what, what does Battery Dance Company, what can Battery Dance Company bring to Vietnam that is new and different and exciting and maybe open some doors for people here. That's what we hope we achieve. <laughs> Battery Dance Company's visit to Vietnam was part of the U.S. Embassy's program to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the normalization of U.S.-Vietnam bilateral relations. Their performances and workshops are expected to foster people-to-people -people diplomacy between the two nations. Uh, well, relations between nations are not just relations between governments. They're between people. And what batter, what's really special uh, about battery dance is they come and they create col a collaboration. So they won't just come and be Americans dancing alone on stage. They will dance with young Vietnamese dancers. And that's what makes it very, very special. Battery dance companies visit not only promotes American culture, but is expected to help build mutual understanding between Vietnam and the United States. How do you think about your role as the bridge to connect uh, the people between the two nations, the United States and Vietnam? There's a, this is a very important year for America and Vietnam, the 20th anniversary of normalized relations. And so the U.S. Embassy gave us the opportunity to bring dance as a vehicle for demonstrating the friendship and sharing between the Vietnamese and American people. Um, so, you know, we're, we're thrilled that we're part of such an important commemoration. And it's hard for me to actually realize that the history was so complicated between our countries. Um, I am 64 years old, so I was a teenager when the Vietnam War was going on. And here I am now, and look at the friendship, look at the relationship. I mean, it just seems like these are two countries that, that really are in harmony in so many ways. Thank you so much for joining in our program today. Thank you so much. It's uh, been a great pleasure to be here. We will now take you to a far away land, Indonesia. As the largest archipelago in the world, comprising of over 10 fathom islands, the land is blessed with natural beauty, historical heritage and cultural diversity. And our VTV reporter Huang Hang will bring you up close to all the splendors of this ultimate travel destination in this week's segment of Connecting Cultures. When talking about Indonesia, the first thing that comes to mind of many people is Bali. Also known as the land of the gods, the island's appeal is found in its sheer natural beauty and serenity. For some people, Bali is not just a destination, it is a paradise because it has it all. From beaches, surfing, diving to retreats, great and small. But what really enticed tourists is the Baliness of it all. It's the essence of Bali that really makes it so much more than just a fun in the sun retreat. Here I see the ancient folk dances became part of the religious and artistic expression of the Balinese people. With the Barong dance being probably the most well known among visitors, the dance originating from the treasures of pre Hindu culture requires as many as 30 dancers for each performance. 
Here backstage dancers are preparing for their Barong dance, one of Bali's most well-known dance for tourists. The dance depicts the battle between good and evil and it is a classic example of Balinese way of acting out mythology, resulting in myth and history blended together into one reality. Showtime! Barong is the magical protector of Balinese villages. He is the opponent of Randa the witch in the never-ending fight between good and evil. The show has proven to be a hit among visitors as it has run for 29 years and is still going strong. The, the theme between the, the good and evil, it's, it's, it's something that uh, we all experience in our day-to-day -day life, so it's very valid, even although it's not our culture, I think in every culture you experience the same thing. So it was very, very interesting and very fun. The dancers were so expressive that you didn't almost need the language, you know, a little bit of background and uh, you really enjoyed the, uh, the show. Legacies of traditions continue to enrich Balinese culture as the island is known for its rich spiritual life, demonstrated through its thousands of temples. The majority of people here devote much of their lives to the Hindu religion and its rites and ceremonies aimed at maintaining harmony in this world. One of Bali's most important Hindu sea temples, Tanalot, is a spectacular site. The temple is located in the southwest of Bali on a rock surrounded by the sea during high tide. Tanalot Temple is one of Bali's most important landmarks famed for its unique offshore setting. The ancient Hindu shrine sits on top of an outcrop amidst constant crushing waves, making it one of Bali's not-to-be-miss icons. Despite not being able to enter the temple, it is still a popular tourist destination because of its beautiful sunset backdrop. The tourists flock to the site in the late afternoon to catch this magnificent view. The beauty is outstanding. The, um, the waves, the surf goes right into the, the cliffs and the sea. And I really appreciate the way that, that the people keep it um, clean and beautiful to preserve it. From sunset to sunrise, Indonesia is never short of wonders for tourists to relish. As the land is filled with active volcanic mountains, I made my way to Mount Bromo, another wonder of Indonesia. to Bromo, an active volcanic mountain in East Java, Indonesia. It's midnight and it's dark and freezing outside, but it's our only chance to get to the top of the mountain before sunrise. And as the local have assured me, the scene is well worth the journey. So we'll see. Mount Bromo peaks at over 2,000 meters above sea level. It is an active volcano, part of the Tenno Massif, one of the most visited attractions in East Java. Tourists come to Bromo to watch the sunrise, and so did I. Its smoke-filled crater, the sea of sand on the way to Bromo's peak, and the chill in the air are surely unforgettable experiences for anyone. It is 6 a.m. and the sun has risen. Behind me is Bromo Mountain and as you can see, the site here is pretty magnificent. So I can definitely see why Bromo is a must-see destination when visiting Indonesia. Another not-to-be-missed site is the Bromo Crater. To reach the top of the crater, you have to climb a steep set of 245 stairs. But the view is worth it. The effect it has is unbelievably stunning. From arts and traditions to striking landscapes, for me, Indonesia is truly a land of wonders and beautiful memories. And our journey to discover Indonesia has also concluded this week's edition of Culture Mosaic. I hope you enjoy the show. And as always, we welcome all of your comments or suggestions for the show at culturemosaic at vtv.vn. And a repeat of our programs are online at vtv4.vn 
or youtube.com slash vtvporgo. So don't forget to check it out. I'm Dai Chang Inhanoyun once again. Thank you very much for being here with us. Goodbye for now.